Hi, and welcome back to part two of this Beginner's Guide to EQ. Let's start by just listening to a mix. Obviously, we have a female singer up front and central, and a band consisting of drums, bass guitar, electric guitar, and keys, mostly using an electric piano sound. Hopefully you're listening in stereo and can hear that the guitar and keys are panned left and right. You may also be able to discern subtler details, like the slapback delay added to the guitar, or the reverb on the keys or the sound of the live room on the snare. However, what we're actually listening to here is a stereo mix down, with one wave for each speaker. All that information is contained within these two wavy lines, and the sense that we can hear each part separately is an illusion. In fact, there's a ton of really sophisticated processing going on between our ears and our brain to decode these signals and make sense of them. If a mix lacks clarity and definition, that means we're having to work harder to try to separate the different elements and hear what's actually going on. Okay, I'm going to create an EQ band and sweep it down to about 50 hertz. Then press the little headphones button in the pop-up display for the band to switch in a band pass filter and listen to just those frequencies. And all we can hear is the boomy low part of the kick drum with a bit of rather indistinct bass guitar behind it. If you're listening on a phone or tablet speaker, you're probably not hearing anything at all. Now I'll sweep the band up about an octave, which is double the frequency. And now we're hearing lots of woolly sounding bass guitar, with a bit of slightly boxy sounding kick behind it. In other words, the balance between these two parts is reversed in these two regions. At 50 Hz the kick drum dominates, but at 100 Hz the bass guitar has taken over. This is no accident. Let's look at the kick drum EQ. In this case, the analyzer clearly shows us the low fundamental frequency of the drum. But we also see some strong harmonics a bit higher. If I try taking out those higher harmonics while the drums are soloed, I might conclude they're too important, as that region adds a pleasing solid thump. But if we listen in context with the bass guitar, that region starts to become congested. The two parts fit together much better if I cut that region to make room for the low meaty part of the bass. This is due to the way our ears and brain work by splitting the signal into many small bands and then focusing on the loudest signal in each of those bands. If we carve out space in our mixes so that the most important parts of each instrument can come through clearly, we can help our brain to decode those signals more easily. So in the same vein, let's also EQ the bass part and shelve down the lowest frequencies to stop them interfering with the low fundamental of the kick drum. Cutting bass frequencies for the bass part may seem counterintuitive, but it's actually the mid-range that allows us to determine the pitch of the note. And if these higher harmonics come through clearly, our brains will perceive a powerful fundamental, even if it's not really there. This also explains how a bass guitar part can be clearly audible on small speakers that don't reproduce any real low bass frequencies. Of course, cutting the low frequencies like this also makes the bass part quieter overall. When working on a desk like this, I can compensate by nudging the fader a bit. And I have two hands, so if I'm switching the EQ in and out to compare the difference, I can nudge the fader a bit each time as well. Pro-Q2 provides a better solution, however. The output section contains an overall gain control, which we can set to compensate for our EQ changes. And we can now bypass both the EQ and the compensating gain together, making it much easier to assess the difference. Alternatively, consider turning on Auto Gain, which will attempt to automatically set the gain to compensate. 
This is an estimate based on typical signals, so you might need to still make slight adjustments. But it will drastically reduce the volume changes caused by your EQ cuts or boosts, which can make it easier to make those decisions. Of course, the mid-range of the bass will also be competing with other elements of the mix, such as guitar and keys and vocal. Let's put the guitar and keys in and consider how they fit together in the mid-range. The analyzer doesn't help so much in this case. All three parts have content all the way through the critical mid-bands, with no obvious clues as to which parts are most significant. And so we're going to have to use our ears. I have to start somewhere, so I'll stick with the bass guitar and sweep a moderate boost around the lower mid-range. I'm looking for a frequency that makes the bass feel right in the mix. And I'm finding this at around 200 Hz. Sweeping down lower sounds too boomy. While sweeping higher loses the warmth. But 200 Hz makes the bass sound warm and deep, yet also tight and well defined. I need to be very careful with this boost, however. Pushing this region of the bass guitar up higher than the parts around it does of course make that part of the bass easier to hear. But we risk creating an overall build-up of energy at that frequency, which, as you'll know from your experiments EQing your reference mixes, will tend to make the mix seem muddy or tubby. The danger is, however, that your ears will quickly become accustomed to this imbalance and stop hearing it. You can spend hours making fine tweaks to a mix and thinking you're doing great work, while failing to spot this kind of overall build-up, simply because your ears and brain have tuned it out. So I'm going to suggest two strategies to avoid this problem. First of all, cutting is usually better than boosting. If I cut that 200 Hz region from the guitar part, and also from the keys, I can allow that part of the bass guitar to dominate in that region, without causing an overall buildup of energy. That's not to say that boosting is always wrong, you just need to be careful. Which brings me to my second strategy. This involves reference mixes again. Drag one of these onto a spare track in your project and mute it. You'll probably also need to turn it down significantly to match the level of your unmastered mix in progress. Then solo that reference track from time to time during mixing. The idea is not to try to copy the reference mix, rather to reset your ears and re-establish normality. If your reference initially seems unbalanced, with too much or too little of the frequencies you've been focused on in your own mix, this is a sign that your ears have started to acclimatise to an imbalance in your own mix. Keep listening until that impression goes away, then switch back to your mix, and chances are you'll notice problems you had tuned out before, such as an overall boxiness, or muddiness, or harshness and you can adjust your settings accordingly. OK, now let's take a look at the guitar part. Of course, an easy way to separate the guitar and keys is to pan them in opposite directions. But this won't translate to the mono version of the mix, and mono compatibility is still important. So consider making these EQ decisions with the mono button pressed in your master section. If I sweep a boost around the mid-range of the guitar, I'm finding the region between about 1 kHz and 1K5 is important for detail and clarity. Sweeping down a bit lower sounds too honky and nasal. And a bit higher becomes harsh and abrasive. But the region just above 1K is a sweet spot. And indeed, this is often an important frequency for electric guitar parts. But again, I'm going to be really careful with this boost. Before I commit to it, I'm going to go hunting for other parts that might be conflicting in that region. The most obvious culprit being the keys. Boosting the same frequency on the keys brings out a hard, edgy character. So I'm going to duck this region behind the guitar with a cut. You might think, if a bit of a cut is good, maybe more is better. Why not cut the gain all the way? Or even switch to a notch filter for an even deeper cut. 
Well, this kind of dramatic EQ might be appropriate occasionally when dealing with a particularly tricky or busy mix. But usually you shouldn't have to completely manufacture the fit between parts at the mixdown stage, as this starts with the arrangement. This combination of bass, guitar and keys is tried and tested, and their sounds contrast with and complement one another already. So I'm really just trying to enhance the natural fit between the parts. Gentler EQ settings can usually achieve that without making the parts sound unnatural and overly processed. OK, while we have the keys EQ up, let's hunt around the lower mids and look for the low meat of the sound. And I'm finding this just above 300 Hz. So let's switch to the bass EQ again and duck that region a bit. And then to the guitar, which actually already has a dip just below it to make room for the bass. There's nothing wrong with two cuts close together like this. Pro-Q2 provides plenty of bands, after all. But equally, there's nothing wrong with keeping it simple and replacing both bands with one wider cut instead. That would be the only option on this desk, of course, with only one lower mid-band available. And it's worth remembering how many classic records were mixed on consoles like this one, with only four, or even sometimes just three bands of EQ available. If you're routinely using dozens of EQ bands on every channel, you might want to rethink your strategy. OK, I'm going to leave you there. Obviously, there are many other things that go into crafting a mix, but none of them as important as good use of EQ. The three things to take away from this video are 1. Train your ears. This is something that will happen naturally as you do more mixing and gain more experience. But you can speed up the process with ear training exercises. 2. Keep your ears fresh while mixing. Give yourself regular breaks and switch to your references from time to time to avoid your ears acclimatising to a lumpy frequency response. And 3. Be careful with those solo buttons. There's nothing wrong with using the solo function to find problem frequencies, but turn it off to make your final EQ decisions or you risk the dreaded downward spiral. Thanks for watching.